Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Delucio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Drive On Podcast. Today, my guest is Dan Lombard. Dan is a Army combat veteran who is a co-founder of Project Refit, which is working to change the negative connotation around getting mental health support. Today, we're going to be discussing Project Refit and all they're doing to help support the military, veteran, and first responder community. So welcome to the show, Dan. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, just to kind of fill in the listeners who may not be familiar with you and what you're doing to kind of let us know who it is that we're talking to today. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I'm, like you said, I'm Dan Lombard, a co-founder of Project Refit. I'm 32. I, I'm, a, I'm an infantryman, was an infantryman. I was in the Army. I enlisted 2013 and I got out my retirement medical retirement date is November 12th, 2017. I deployed to Afghanistan 2013 to 14 for nine months. And then I waived my dwell time. I stayed home, stayed back at Bliss for four months and then went to Djibouti, Africa for seven and a half months, seven and a half. So Af Afghanistan was the start of all of this. So I was fresh out of basic training, like two months out of basic training. And they, we went to Afghanistan. So I didn't do NTC, none of the, I didn't do any of those fun schools. We were a heavy weapons company. So when we went to, we were in RC West. So we were in Shindan province. So where we were, they hadn't patrolled the units that we had replaced and up like five years prior to that, they hadn't patrolled that area really outside of the wire. So the Taliban had really overrun the majority of where we were at. So when we got there, my leadership, I guess, started pushing for more direct missions and not just FOB security, at least going to patrol do some screen lines, go and patrol some villages at night, see what's going on. So we inevitably got that. We got the, with the go to do that. So we got there, I want to say this, it's early December. Yeah, I think early December in 2013, we had our first firefight, January 28th, there's five dudes there. So that was like the first time, like that was my first combat experience, period. And they were, it was five Taliban dudes. They were in a, they were just running through a field. They, we had a, like our IR lights on and everything. So they didn't, they could hear us coming, but they didn't see us. They fired an RPG at the front. Of, I was in the, the lead vehicle. I was a passenger in the lead vehicle. They fired an RPG at that, missed us, missed the front of us by 10 feet. We had p tits watching us the whole time. We were like two clicks off the, off the, off the base, I think something like that. So they had a dragon off, they had an RPK, sorry, PKM, K and the, um, the, the launcher, obviously. So, I mean, I was in a couple firefights here and there. Like I would, like that was a, a direct firefight. I was a gunner for a lot of, a lot of the deployment. Most of the deployment, I'd say I was actually a dismount, but I was a driver for a very short period of time. And that's really kind of where this all comes together. We were, I was, so we were in Matt V's and we were, like I said, we were heavy weapons companies, two, two, two 240s, 250 cals and a Mark 19. Mark, 20, Mark 19 was the um, second vehicle in formation, which I was driving that vehicle. We were driving down a wadi and for anybody who's listening that doesn't know what that is, it's just a river without the water. It's just the river bed. The locals in Afghanistan use that as a highway essentially. And so we do too. So it's, it was nighttime. We were just coming back from a KLE talking to one of the local Afghan army guys and uh, it had just rain. So there was a bunch of puddles and like you're trained. If you follow the vehicle in front of you, Chances are, then they don't hit a bomb. Chances are you're not going to hit an IED. Like your chances, like nine times out of 10. And then you're also taught like, hey, if there's a puddle, like that's a really good indicator that might be an IED. There was like 15 puddles. So are they all IEDs? Are two of them? It's all these thoughts are going through your head the whole time. Um, so I was talking to my lieutenant and I have a habit of looking at somebody when I'm speaking to them. And like I said, I was driving and I turned and we were, we just so happened to be talking about how we were the only platoon who hadn't gotten blown up by an IED yet. Yeah, right, speaking that into existence. And as I turned back, my lead vehicle had made its turn onto the hardball road. And I just, I, there was too many track marks. I had to guess which one was theirs. And I guessed wrong. <laughs> it was a very bad guess. So the, drove over the pressure, pressure plate. It was a 200 pound IED. So it blew the back left tire off. So those vehicles have a combat locks on the, all four doors have that big metal lever locket, nothing coming in from the outside. Well, I, 
for whatever reason, I did not lock mine and the interpreter did not lock his. That was the only thing that saved our lives. So the, when the IED went off, it does an implosion, then an explosion. So the explosion went up to the two doors that weren't in combat lock. It blew those doors open. They stayed open. My gunner, he, he got, so the gunner's harness snapped and he got launched on the hood of the, on the map thing and just blacked out. Um, so like I said, I was driving when the concussive blast went out, my helmet nipped, and then I got launched up and hit my head on the, the IRs, the DVE screen that we used, uh, the case metal boxer. What that is. So I slammed my head against steel and blacked out for under a minute. I, I obviously don't know the exact time frame. So when I came to, it was exactly like the, I, I don't, and I don't know if it's the influence of seeing the movies or if this is just a factual thing that happens, but how well, the dust falls like slow motion and you can pick each speck out of the scope that, that happened to a T. Everybody knows the ringing in the ears happens, but so I was on fire from my waist down. Let me back up a little bit. So the IED had ignited a fire immediately. There was never like, from the second the pressure plate went off, the back of the fire flew off and it, uh, it ruptured the fuel and oil lines. So that just like, immediately ignited a fire. It was pouring into the vehicle. I blacked out. That's what I woke up to was me on fire from like about there. And I was like, my, like my ass and legs were like facing out of the driver's side. And I was like, pulling like, just trying to alleviate one. Like one was hot, one wasn't. They both were hot, but one was less hot. And like. I'll shit on some of the stuff about the army, but th that uniform, I don't have permanent burn marks. Not like I had a first degree burn and it was actually just the exposed skin because of the, the light from the IED, not even the fire. So our vehicle had one of the, one of the dismounted 240s had left a hundred round belt of 762. So that was actually cooking off in the truck while I was trapped in there. So I couldn't jump out because there was a lake of fire. I also, I didn't know if it was an initiator for an ambush, so I'm not jumping out and just getting gatted. That's not in my wheelhouse. And I couldn't climb right because the radio mount was just, it, there was like less than a foot of space and I was in fight or flight. I had like the double mag pouches on, my, on the front of me. So I just like, if I would have taken my kid off, easy through, but I was in a state of sheer. So that didn't register just yet. I guess after like picture a feral animal, like if you threw like a cat in a cage, like in a cage and put fire around it, that's basically how I was. I couldn't find a way out. So, and then my light flashed while the, when I woke, when I came to and the specks were falling and the ringing in the ears and stuff, I don't remember the memories, but I remember the, like the feeling of the emotions. And I attribute that to either my brain was like, Hey, we're ending now. This is, look at all the fun stuff we did. It's time to go. Or yo, this is the shit we've done. Let's get it together and get back in. So for whatever reasons that's so yeah the 100 round bed of the 7 was the 762 was cooking off i remember so i actually got really close with the gunner him and i ended up having the same therapist and psychiatrist after the so that's the only reason i actually know this piece of information i remember like an adult just screaming loud you know what i mean like yo i'm on fire i can't get out fucking help me picture somebody burning alive like that blood curdling scream that's what was happening like you know what i mean but my brain will never allow me to remember. So I only, he said that to the, so that's what woke him up. He came to because he heard that screaming. And then just in that, I took my kid off, jumped out. He came to, jumped on top of me. He only had his M9 and he was scanning the, the Wadi to see if we were getting ambushed. And I, and I think it was about like 20, 30 feet up. So I mean, they, the, if it was, they, so two slow pause and they both ran up clearing the area. They were no regard to their own lives coming to pull us out of that map D if we were not already out. Um, so they cleared above the wadi for the met. I had run to the lead vehicle. We all had to the lead vehicle. I got in the, uh, the back of it and threw up the ship. And then my staff sergeant saw, my squad leader saw, I had holes in my, my combat shirt. So he thought shrapnel. He like, <laughs> like punched me in the fucking chest and like ripped it open. And nothing. It was just from climbing over the radio mount. Just shit just got tugged and stuff. So that, that was the, so I mean, got medevac back, you know, and I didn't, that's when I learned that you, at least when I was there, you have to call home when you get hurt. There is no option. Can't not call. So my mom, she works at a public school. So like we would Skype, Facebook video. We would never phone call. So I had to have a phone guy called and I have a brother and a sister and I'm immersed with that town that I grew up in that they support Project Brief so much from the very beginning. So they all know me and the, she's like, oh my God, hi. And I was like, hey, can I, uh, like I'm, I still have morphine in me. Like I'm still smoking. This is like an hour after I got back from the burning vehicle. And I was like, hey, can I talk to my mom, please? Yeah. 
So she said, Hey, your son's on the phone. And my mom said, which one? She said, Danny. And she was like, Oosh. like she knew it was like some, something happened. So I explained, I say, hey, mom, like got blown up. I drove over a bomb. I'm good. All my limbs are here. I'm not, there's no gashes. Like there's no, like I'm okay. But she knew what was really going to, like, she knew what was really fucked up. You know what I mean? Like she knew right there that. PTSD. It's, it is guaranteed to happen. So I think the first firefight chipped away a little bit of my innocence that I didn't really necessarily know was there and had the capability of being taken. And then that IED, when I truly believed that I was going to die, that just, that I think that took the majority. There's still some level semblance of innocence, but it's more of a memory and not like an actual tangible thing that you can see in people. You know what I mean? So that kind of... That kind of sparked the, started the PTSD. I didn't know it then, obviously. And then I was in probably a little over a dozen other firefights. Um, I was only in one other IED. That was only like 85, 90 pounds, maybe a hundred max, no fire. But that one, so there's a lot of, with my PTSD, there's a lot of survive, not even necessarily survivor's guilt because we all survive, but shame and responsibility and guilt. Bravo, that was, so Bravo was the gunner. He was the gunner that got, Dejected and walked out. So that, he ended up having three concussions. So he got sent to Germany. They did scans on his brain and he had brain lesions. So he had to get sent home. So he took that as him leaving us and abandoning us. So he turned to not healthy coping mechanisms and that inevitably got him moved from the military uh, partially. It was a weird process, but that's something I take responsibility for because the very first concussion he had was the IED I was driving, paying attention to the road. Like, I used to have 100% responsibility. That is my fault. There is no getting around. Where it's true, I've been in, been in therapy since 2016, I think. So through, I mean, I still hold a decent amount of responsibility because to me, it's factual. I stopped paying attention and did not adhere to my training and injuries happened because of it. It's cut and dry. So with that, I went on my, on my second deployment after that. Still didn't really, there was no PTSD. Like none of that. I was fucking good. I was in for 25 years. Like we were doing... My command sergeant major actually in a firefight, he was wounded. And a couple of days later, he passed away from the wounds. He made it all the way back to San Antonio. And he was, his name was Gunny. He was just a larger than life individual, like the epitome of a leader. He would be on missions with us. If he wasn't with us, he was with the next platoon. He would go with us. We'd come back from mission. Next people going out, he was on with it. He wasn't staying back on base, bullshitting and doing staying. He was digging up IEDs with us and shit. Like he did stuff. He was a Marine for six years and then he was in the army for 22. He's in the 75th Rangers. Like he was a, he's a born warrior. I firmly believe that. And just like I said, the epitome of a leader. I had the best leadership ever in the beginning and I had the worst at the end, last year. But certainly it was kind of after he, after we lost him, I kind of lost the, uh, the will and the urge to be a lifer. Let's see what happens at this point. Then I went on my second deployment and that was to Africa. It was right after Benghazi. So we were QRF for 13 different countries in Africa that if their embassy resembled anything like Benghazi, we were going to be, we were, we would be there within 24 hours and we would un-Benghazi it. We got called up like a, like three, four times for Sudan. It never happened. We always got rejected, like it got recalled, but that's where my parents started a divorce. They started their divorce. That was always on the rocks, but it was final. And I think military life and family life clashing was just the catalyst that I needed. So when I came back, I started therapy and then got diagnosed with PTSD. And I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty rational and logical. Obviously, we tend to not be sometimes when we're when I, in our unhealthy mindsets. But even then, if you can pretty much prove to me that the way I'm thinking is irrational and illogical, and you show me at least a way to circumvent that thought, I'm probably going to go with the new route because it's the real way to think. So like I did CPT, cognitive processing therapy, and that's, that saved me. But I was looking for something. So I got my 90%, I got my VA rating and I was looking for something side of the military back in New Jersey, where I would be able to adjust back to society, but with my people, with my people, you know what I mean? And there's nothing, <laughs> there was nothing. I found one, I found one nonprofit and I'm not going to name them just because at that time. It was like, dude, fuck you. It was, it's typing. You get paired with a random vet. And you just type. I need this. I need to see that you give a shit about what I'm talking about. It hurts to talk about this. I don't want to waste these emotions when I don't even know how to process. It. So I got paired. I got paired with a guy who was in the Navy in the 80s. Now, God bless that man. I would love to talk to him now. You know what I mean? Genuine. But back then, I was in a place where I needed a combat veteran to speak with me, or at least I thought. So I started doing therapy and... She was a civilian and she had obviously dealt with veterans. So she knew the jargon and everything, but 
She helped. And then James, the other co-founder of Project Reset, he's a civilian, he's the business, the entrepreneur side, that kind of stuff. He reached out to me. I had made a, I had made a post on Facebook to the people from home that I'm different. I'm not Dan that you knew before Afghanistan, before the army. It's a different Dan. There's still a little bit of old Dan, but I'm irritable. I'm Jade. Like, you're going to think I'm a dickhead. Like, that stuff happens. It's not you. Like, as cliche as it sounds, it's not a huge thing. It truly isn't me. So James saw that and he, we were mutual friends. We had met one time before. It was actually on my leave from Afghanistan. And so he saw that post and he took that as a sign of leadership and reached out and basically asked what the army does to prevent PTSD from happening and suicidal attempts from happening. And if they occur, or if you are diagnosed, how do they help him? That and he, I was being ushered out of the military. So I mean, you call it a little chip on your shoulder or what, but I mean, I was pretty on it. Like they don't do shit for you. Like I'm being kicked out. Like it's, that's the way I saw it. So him and I talked for four hours, just this for four hours. I love therapy. I still do. I will be in therapy for the rest of my life. It just works. For me. I like individual therapy. I like green. I like having an unbiased opinion to just throw shit at, but uh, uh, it wasn't enough. There was too much in my brain. There was too much pain and thoughts and emotions and beliefs that some were fake. So, you know what I mean? There was just mm-hmm. like, and James and I talked for four hours and a lot, I got a lot of it out. And I just, I immediately felt the relief and I was like, fuck, dude, this is like, this is kind of like what we need because all it resembles is sh- whether you were in the cough, whether you were next to the smoke pit, whatever you were, ne- chilling with your boys or girl, asexual, whatever it is, the dudes, and just talking about life. Whether it's military related or not, just sitting there and having, you give a fuck about me. I can tell you things. Like there's no, I don't have to worry about you. You know, you're really fucked up. The guy, I know that's why I'm talking, talking to you, dude. Like you're supposed to help me with that. What do you tell? So we started seeing that and it kind of just flourished from there. We got a massive following and just from the beginning, because all my dudes that I served with just immediately started supporting all the people, like I said, the people from home, Magnolia, shout out Magnolia, the, the school, the fire company, the town themselves, the mayor, they're all. Anything we need, they're like, yo, come, you need the rec center, come use it. You want to come in our parade, please? From the firehouse, we, every fifth Wednesday, we go there and have one of our radio check, which I'll explain, and hold it for them, just specifically for them, so they can have a, a controlled, semi-structured environment to talk about their experiences and how it makes them feel. You know, I love this whole story, this whole, the backstory. I, I love hearing about, whenever I talk to people, I love hearing their stories, the the combat experiences, everything that they've gone through, because it really helps to shape what you're doing now. If you didn't have those experiences, if you didn't drive over that IED, you may not be here doing the same thing. You'd be here, but you wouldn't be doing this necessarily. Um, yeah, project doing... Re- there's a really good chance. They're, they're not even a real, it's factual. If what happened in Afghanistan didn't happen, Project Grief wouldn't exist. Right. I and... truly don't, I wouldn't have had the motivation to try and help people in that situation, because I didn't, I wouldn't have had that mindset of how painful this actually is. Sure. And it's an important thing to have for other people who are out there. Not only is it important for them, but it's also important for you, giving you a sense of purpose, you know, you're continuing to serve other people in this way. And it, and it's not just you, I'm not making this out like it's Project Reason. I know what you mean. Yep. Yeah. It's everyone involved is yes. now has this mission and it's a great thing. So tell us more. I know you started to mention a little bit about uh, some of the programs and stuff that you guys yeah. are taking part in. Tell us about Project Refit, what you guys are doing to change the way that we think about mental health support in the various uh, programs that you have available. Absolutely. So the very first thing is we have, uh, we call it our radio check buddy check-in. So it's every night or every Monday and Friday night from 9 p.m. Eastern till roughly mid. And the Monday Zoom is live streamed to Facebook. So I'll go on there. I left this out. So in 2015 or 16, I don't remember which one, attempted suicide. It was the anniversary of the day that Gunny got shot. And I was just really, obviously, I drank a whole bottle of Crown Apple. I was in my fields and attempted. So I will openly talk about that. And just so people can see that you can talk about it with Al the world caving in around you. Like society isn't just going to come punch you in the face because you're being open about something you experienced, which right. is a whole other thing. We'll get to that later. And then the Friday ones are closed. I mean, anybody can come in the Zoom, but it's not broadcast on Facebook. If you go on our, if you do want to come into the Zoom, you can go on our, fi- our website, projectrefit.us. And like the first thing you see is join Zoom. You click that between 9 p.m. and midnight, Monday or Friday, and you will come 
right into the Zoom. It's it, like I said, it's said that's semi structured. We have topics that we adhere to. If the conversation is getting dull, if it's not doing anything too hot. But if somebody comes in and they have something to talk about and they're in a place or just they need to talk about what happened, they need to talk about anything. There is no topic. That's the, you're the topic now. Let's get you situated, see how we can help you. We, we don't, we encourage people to go to therapy. Let me say that. We have people who they'll experience us and then they'll be like, oh, this is my fix. You, we're, we are a piece of the puzzle. We're a cog in the machine. We're, we're part of it. You, some people should also be in, you shouldn't stop therapy for if you find something, you know what I mean? There should, you should have multiple options, multiple resources, multiple tools in your toolbox to use. Even if you have a really shiny brand new one that's working better than all the other ones, you're going to need some of them other ones lo- later down the line. And uh, yeah, so the Friday ones are more uh, people who don't want their information, their business out there in, in the public, which I get. There's people who are in careers that they can't talk about their mental health because security clearances or their job will just simply... Leave, make them leave. So the Friday ones are good for that. We have, and we have rules for that also. Just so, so if anybody's going to join the Zoom, like whoever's the moderator, so it's, you will know when you go in, me, Mel, James, respect the moderator's decision to guide the conversation because we're all military. We're all war first responders. We all have strong personalities and we want to kind of dominate conversations. So the moderator, look, just respect that aspect of it. Look, we're vulgar, you know, like that's just what we've grown up in. It's, that's part of Project Refit, but there's a line. And you don't cross the line. There's no derogatory shit. There's no racism. There's no, none of that stuff. We love all of our brothers and sisters, regardless. Just curse all you want. Stay on the right side of the line. There's a one strike rule. Like you do that and you are gone. We have evidence of that. <laughs> so, and then a lot of us have TBIs. So if, if, if I'm talking, I mean, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, but I'll, you will not interrupt. Yeah, I could be talking the whole time in a blank slate out of nowhere. So a lot of us have that and we try and minimize interruptions. I mean, obviously, if somebody has something really potent and helpful to say, you're going to probably forget it. So go ahead and jump in. But we keep your opinions to you. You know what I mean? Like the sure. it's still on that person. And then for anybody who is a, uh, we're, none of us are certified. None of us are clinicians. This is not the place for clinicians. This is a peer to peer support group. So if you are certified in anything, you will not diagnose in these Zooms or in Project Grief it, in general at an event. Talk, not, there's no diagnosis. That's not, that is not our role, period. So that's our Zooms. We have, like I said, we have our website, projectrefit.us. If you want to volunteer, we have a volunteer tab. You can fill out it. We love volunteers. We want more. If you're, especially if you're a student, I'm in college now. So I'm learning about like graduate degrees and internships and all that stuff that's needed for a degree. If you need volunteer hours, come to us. We need volunteers. So when, right now, the biggest thing for us is our, our mobile base. So it's a, it's a 24 foot long trailer and we've cust- we have customized it. On the one side, it's got a stage drop down, like stage door drop down. And it's got three legs that, so it's the nice little walkout patio, essentially. The other end, the whole end drops down. We have air heating in there, lights, Wi-Fi, TV, benches, tables. And that is so we can do our radio check buddy check-ins wherever we need to be. We are, we pride ourselves that we're hybrid. James and I, the other co-founder, he, we flew to... Florida, we got in contact with a police officer through another nonprofit. He'd been held hostage, like shotgun to his head. So he took a little time off of work for that. And then when he went back to work, he had a guy handcuffed. And just the way he had the guy handcuffed, the guy cinched and just broke his fingers in his hand, in his dominant hand, more importantly. And so he has two daughters and a wife and the, they had just had a storm and the two daughters rooms the, on the same wall. Their, the insulation and drywall was gone. So he can't physically put up the insulation drywall and the floating floor. He had all of the supplies, so we didn't have to buy any of them. So James and I flew out there for a weekend and just did that for him. You know what I mean? Just threw up the insulation, <laughs> threw up the drywall. We didn't spackle and all that. He's like, dude, I can do that at some, that's not the hard part. It's putting it up. So it's e- like small things like that. So we take our, like I said, we take our mobile base anywhere and everywhere we can. Um, sporting events, anywhere where our people will be or would like to go. So one of the, one of the ventures we're trying to do with the mobile base is get involved, especially with the Philadelphia Eagles, but any of the Philadelphia teams or sports in general, but with stadiums, there's, there are countless veterans, first responders, current military that don't go to these events because of the environment where we were set up with our mobile base right outside of the event. They can come out, yo, it's too much anxiety and shit. Let's go into this mobile base, talk to the dudes for a little bit. 
and then go right back to the event. 20 minutes later, I'm feeling a little el- hour. Li- However, we really want to do that. Another thing is the uh, senior citizen homes, assisted livings and things like there's Vietnam, there's Korean War, World War II veterans with these stories that one, many of us have never even got a chance to hear and they're disappearing by the day. And that just, it kills me seeing that. So that's another area. So the with the mobile base, though, we have a, a monthly donor program. So it could be $5. We have somebody who's doing 250 which blew my mind. Thank you so much. But anything, any amount, and there's you get a dog tag, and you get to put it up put up in the mobile base. So as soon as you walk in our mobile base, there's a dozen or two dozen of them already just sitting up there. So we bring that to, we actually, in June, one of the, we do a yearly retreat, one really big retreat, and then we'll do two, like, smaller, like, fucks five, six people retreat where the yearly one is usually around a dozen and we pay for it. So in June, we flew out 12 veterans, a first responder and her son. We camped on a ranch, Stillwater Ranch in Colorado. Love you. Camped on that ranch for six days. They, it was, aside from my time in Afghanistan, it was the greatest week I've had in recent memory. It was just a very, excuse me, beautiful thing. Every day at 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., we had uh, like scheduled events. So it would be fly fishing, horseback riding, archery. We went, and we went to the range and the guys who took us are actual weapon manufacturers there. And they took us back to their manufacturing plant. And like, it was just like, it was, we belong. Like, they never met us, but like it, it clicked immediately. And it, it just felt so good. We went fly fishing and I had never been fly fishing in my entire life. Water was cold, but we had the waist high waders and I fell in love. Just the pressure of that water on my legs. Like I have bad legs just from the military. It like instantly, I was like, dude, I could stand for like four hours in this shit. Where normally like you got me for about 45 minutes and I have to sit down. So we did that kind of stuff. And so say you came and you weren't interested in that. You didn't want to stay at the ranch. They had a dozen horses, ducks, goats. It was huge. It was beautiful. But the only thing we actually, like if you wanted to go and explore Colorado, like in the local area, obviously, we don't want you driving in this thing. 45 or four hours or some shit. But if you want to explore Colorado, go do that. You're an adult. Like, you're, this isn't prison. The only thing we actually required was at eight, at 8 o'clock at night, every night, we had a giant bonfire and everybody sat in a circle around the bonfire and we were present. And people who wanted to share, share. And we had people who needed to talk who came specifically for that. They didn't give a shit about horseback riding or fishing or shooting. They wanted to talk. And that was it. There was a couple guys who came where alcohol is a very important aspect in their life to the point where withdrawal is a symptom right now. And with my own eyes, I witnessed the second day we were there, they controlled their intake of alcohol. They weren't escaping. They were managing the symptoms of withdrawal. Instead of chugging from a liquor bottle, they had half a beer, just, you know what I mean? Just to get, and they were sharing and they were opening up and they were talking and I'm still in contact with like, Every two weeks, I'd say, Max, well, I'll talk to one of them. Look, people know we give a shit. I think that's, that's really what it is. People know, like, like, I have no horse in this. I do have a horse in this race. I go through exactly what most of these people are going through. So that is my horse. But there's no financial gain for me for this. You, There's no subscriptions. There's, a, like, we sell shirts and hats and that kind of stuff. You don't have, like, if you don't buy that, whatever. This is, we genuinely see an issue with our people. There's a, there's an. This suicide thing happening just blows my mind. I, so something we talk, that's something we'll openly talk about. I specifically will like hone in on. I believe that there is a difference between suicidal and wanting your pain day. And I think the vast majority of veterans and first responders who are taking their lives aren't doing it because they want to die. They're doing it because they don't have anywhere to put their pain. They have nobody to take their pain for them, from them, or help them navigate through it for that. Where it, we, we have, we, we have just, that's exactly what we do. We have people who are in different stages of therapy. We have people who have never been in it. We have a guy who experienced it, didn't like it, and just started researching his own stuff and genuinely found some healthy coping mechanisms. And now like branches with a little bit of therapy and his own, everybody's walked their own path and they're willing to share how they got there. And I think there's a lot of fear of the unknown. I have all of this shit in my mind and I have no idea if, am I in control? If I start opening up about it, am I going to lose control and I'm going to feel that, is it going to flood out? There's a very potent aura, if you will, of camaraderie. It's that it just has not subsided. We, 
Look, I'm not a big reader. I don't really like reading too much. I get bored fast. My mind's in a billion places at once. But I read this one book. It's, it's called by Dr. Edward Tick, Returning the Soul from War, I believe. And in the very, very first page, he says, the king god Odin, he gave his eye, sacrificed his eye for infinite wisdom. And I was like, oh, very cool. And he said, what if PTSD is our sacrifice for wisdom? Because the growth that we get from managing and adapting to the PTSD symptoms is growth that people who don't experience trauma will never be able to have. There's, it's a, there is a silver lining to it almost. But what I'm fascinated by is in tribal times, Aztecs, Mayans, even the Romans, that kind of stuff, when they would come back from war, the warriors, all of the village, everybody in the village would get together and they would have, I know like the Mayans, they would have a really long wooden plank with spikes on it. And everybody would lean into it together and bleed and feel pain together so that there was no PTSD. They all felt the same amount of pain from that battle. Where now in society, it's not tribal anymore. It's completely individualist, completely. Right? I think for us, I think humans have adapted past the tribal mentality. But I think for people who have served in the first responder professions, a military profession, you've unlocked that or at least brushed on that tribal mentality that we've evolved past and i don't think you can close that door i think once we open that door again it's a perm it could be a permanent open and we need a group we need us we need our brothers and sisters to sustain us well and you need in the military and first a lot of first responder professions you need that community you need those other people you're relying on the person to your left to your right to do their job in order for you to for do yours. the whole unit to be able to complete their mission, whatever size that unit is, but it's never just a single individual. It's always it's a, a group of, of people, right? A team who's out there trying to accomplish something. And once in you learn to rely on people like that, it's hard. Like you said, it's hard to turn that off. You know, maybe it's possible to turn it off, but yeah, it has to be possible. But I think that's a journey. Not many of us have ventured down. You know what I mean? I don't, it hurts to turn that off. We've been introduced to something that's that powerful and then to just pre not pretend it doesn't exist, but admit that it won't be the same ever. Well, it's like when you find something that works for whatever thing is that you're doing, you find a way that works and then it's like, why would you go and screw with that? Like it you works. don't fix something that's like, not broken. Exactly. Right. So, so then you get out of the military in a system that worked and you go into another system, which also works, but it's different from the old system, but it's like, I think the military is controlled chaos and the real yeah. world is just chaos. And we're <laughs> used to that at least controlled element of it. There, this shit's going to be wild, but within these spectrums where the world, this shit's just wild. And we, it's just, I think that the, it's, and I mean, every VA, everybody said, but the first year out is the worst year is you come into terms that you're not with your tribe anymore. You have to right. find a new tribe. Where are the new tribe? That's the whole point. Like we, we will, we are the new tribe. Another thing we do is reunions. So we just okay. had one in November, September, November, e. bad brain, but one of those dates Damn. and two different units got together and we had, it's, it's TJ, one of our, um, one of our advisors, actually, he, he hosts the reunions. He's got two acres, nice little, it was beautiful. And just seeing what that is. I mean, these are dudes who haven't seen you like go years without seeing each other and then bam. And just seeing that they've known each other for 20, 20 years. You know what I mean? Like seeing that level of love. Cause that's really powerful. It's, I don't really think there's many things that can compare to it. And that's an awesome thing too. Cause I know my own unit when we talked about getting together and doing some sort of reunion and everything like that. The plans always fall through. We ne nothing ever works. We, we haven't done it yet. It's it was, 2010 is when we were in Afghanistan all together. You know, shortly after that was the last time that we were all in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, it, people have inevitably, they go off to different units. They get out of the military altogether. Like that. That just happens. And then, Life. you know, eventually there's nobody left. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know, we all keep in touch. We have a, you know, Facebook chat that we have going on that we all just keep in touch with each other to make sure everyone's doing all right. If someone needs something or, you know, is having some issues, we just jump on the chat and we, we 
chat with each other, but it's different than being in person, you know, actually being yes. able to be there with each other and hang out and just shoot the shit for a little while, you know, just catch up and everything like that. But, but that's awesome. I think that's a, a huge benefit to what you guys are doing in addition to everything else that you guys are doing, but just that just organizing and facilitating the ability to get people together in that way is huge. And that has some therapeutic effects too. Just I think it has like resound a resounding amount of therapeutic value to it. It has to. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be that, that one-off case where you had that one guy who just didn't get along with anybody else or whatever. Yeah. Okay. That's an edge case, but I think in the, yeah. the vast majority of cases, you're going to have a group of people who are really tight and, you know, bringing them back together. It's just going to, it's just going to be a great experience. So that's awesome. I think in all reality, we all yearn for that. Like I, I would, I, so I went to, um, one of the high schools near me had uh, for veterans day, they had me come and speak for my, tell my story for the, about project grief it also. And then the grade school did also. And I had like, I mean, obviously it comes up, would you do it again? And like, yeah, obvious, like not obvious. They're asking because they don't know, but yeah, I mean, yeah, like it's that they were the most influential months because i love to say years but months of my life like that nine months was i mean that's where i found who i was that's where i truly found me and lost me in the same like in the same grass hey you're here oh god you're gone but do it a billion times over i also had a, a young girl ask i mean she was a sixth grader i think she asked me did you win the war and i was like oh fuck. i was like look that's a that's a hard question i said on the outside no they the people we were fighting are now the government like no we lost I said, but I know for a fact that we liberated every village that surrounded us. They begged us to, they asked us to, they thanked us when we did. So just knowing that we saved some lives for some time, even if it's not sustainable, I have to accept that. So right. that, and I, that's I, I even use this example, this analogy, I should say, in describing just pull out from Afghanistan, the whole debacle that took place, you know, a little over a year ago now mm -hmm. is so back in the sixties, my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. And she went to the doctor, fought it, took all the medications, the treatments and everything like that. She went into remission and she ended up living another 20 years before the cancer came back and yeah. eventually took her. But was the efforts of the doctors back 20 years earlier all for nothing? No, because she was given another 20 years of life. And whether it was 20 years or 20 days or... Yeah. Whatever, it's like she still had that much more. And I think the people that were living in those villages that you guys went to and liberated and helped them live, even if it's just a short period of time, live under some relative peace and freedom and whatever words you want to throw at it. I mean, it's not for nothing, right? I like that. I like that a lot. I didn't, I have never thought of it from that. But really, at the end of the day, there was some peace and some security to those people's lives. And I feel like in a way that type of freedom and that type of lifestyle could have potentially been infectious. And maybe those people would have wanted to fight for that and want to provide that for their children and their children's children and things yeah. like that. And so, you know, honestly, when I saw the withdrawal, the debacle that went on, with all of that, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I just hope that some of these people that we helped will stand up and fight back at some point. You know, it may not be today, may not be tomorrow, may, maybe, you know, later on in the year or whatever, but hopefully someone will start standing up and fighting back. And, you know, I, we don't get the kind of news coverage that you would get yeah. from, you know, downtown, you know, Atlanta or something, like, you know what I mean? You don't get that from coming out of Afghanistan anymore. So. Who knows? Maybe they Man. are. Maybe it's a long fight. Maybe they're having some progress. I really don't know. I like, even if I can lie to myself and just tell myself that's what they're doing, then I'm yeah. going to do that, you know? So, yeah, I think, um, I think that's one of the only things we can do with that situation. I mean, it's kind of I'm sure. our hands are tied there. Exactly. Well, like any nonprofit, I know you mentioned volunteers that you're looking for. I'm sure you're also looking for support in terms of donations and other things like that. You mentioned the website for the volunteers. I'm assuming that's also where people can go to to make a donation as well. Yeah, everything's on there. If you want to become a monthly donor, it's on there. If you want to do a one-time donation, it's on there. The hit, like the history of us, the co-founders, that's all on there. Mobile Base Initiative's on there. Yeah, yeah. So projectrefit.us. Excellent. 
And so I'll have a link to that in the show notes for anyone who's interested in volunteering or donating or supporting in any way. I'm sure there's other things that I'm not even thinking about that you may have or pop available. Into Zoom. If you want to come in the Zoom, that's that's also an avenue to, to get in. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, hop in, into the Zoom meeting and I've been on the website. It's right there. Really easy. It's on the, I mean, you can't miss it. So, like when you load the page, it's there. It's right in front of you. So just click on the thing and hop in on the Zoom. Daniel, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today, hearing your story, learning about Project Refit and everything that you guys are doing. I'm really excited about what you guys are doing and you know, glad to help spread the word about this. I really do appreciate all the hard work that you guys are putting in and everything that you do for the veterans and the first responders out there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on here. It's, I appreciate you being a conduit for all of the, like you said at the beginning, all these nonprofits that may not have a reach or the veterans or first responders who may not have the ability to find us. You're doing a great cause by even giving us a little broadcast that's happening. I appreciate you very much. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to support the show, please check out Scott's book, Surviving Son, on Amazon. All of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. 